Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtadar Khan, your host, and I'm coming to you again with another diplomatic briefing. This time about Xi Jinping, the premier of China's visit to Moscow and to meet his best friend, Vladimir Putin. This is an important development since China or the Chinese president has not visited Russia since the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. Of course, Xi Jinping met with Putin uh, just a few weeks before the war started. And one of the questions that still lingers is, uh, did Putin share with uh, Xi Jinping the information that he was going to invade Ukraine? Uh, and uh, what advice uh, did Xi Jinping give to him at that time? Uh, I have no intel on that. And I've not seen any authoritative reports trying to explain to us what conversations those two gentlemen had at that time. At this time, Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow comes just a few hours after the ICC uh, issues a warrant for the arrest of Vladimir Putin for crimes against humanity. And it is interesting, either the warrant was timed uh, to coincide with Xi Jinping's visit uh, or Xi Jinping uh, decided to ignore the warrant anyway. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to try and break it up in six questions that should probably explain what has happened uh, in uh, Moscow. But before I do that, uh, please subscribe to Conversations, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell icon. Don't forget to like the video and do share it with your colleagues, with your students, with your friends, with your social political network. It's for me, it's critical that you share it with lots of people so that as there are more subscribers, uh, it becomes a greater and greater motivation for me to do more of this. Uh, I apologize to some of you who have been loyal friends of Conversations and I was away for two, three days in Boston. So I could not upload any new videos. While I was in Boston, I did visit the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum that is fabulous. Uh, Bostonians are lucky to have it in the city. And those of you who plan to visit Boston in the near future, make sure that you visit this museum. It's three, four hours of sublime experience. So coming to what happened in Moscow, it appears that China is now the world's number one peacemaker after brokering the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which none of us had expected or anticipated the dialogue that was taking place between the two countries uh, had nearly faded away and somehow Xi Jinping brought them both together. And now we have an agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which could transform the politics of the Middle East and even have global impacts. It remains to be seen how serious that impact is, uh, the treaty is, the agreement is, and how long will it last? Will the two countries behave themselves and that remains to be seen, but at the moment, China is glowing in the success of brokering a deal. And now, the most difficult one, Xi Jinping is trying to broker a ceasefire first and then a peace process between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, a few weeks before he came to Moscow, he released his 12-point plan, which was not very specific, did not actually articulate a pathway to peace between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it essentially basically said these are 12 important points that we need to keep in mind. And then it advocates that there should be a peace process and a dialogue between the two countries. Of course, uh, the Chinese plan also condemns talk of nuclear weapons, of course, expresses abhorrence at the prospect of use of nuclear weapons. Uh, but it does not criticize Russia for the brutality with which the Russian war has been conducted nor does he criticize Russia or Putin for the invasion to start the war itself. Uh, so the Western countries, needless to say, are being very critical on that particular issue. But I also feel that the Western countries are very troubled by this idea that China is now the global peacemaker. While they are warmongers, they are protracting and keeping this war going by giving weapons to one side and hoping that side wins. As far as the West is concerned, they are going to keep fighting this as long as the Ukrainians are willing to fight this till Russia is defeated. So there is no peace plan coming from the West. So the only active plan that is being promoted is by China. And uh, the image that China is now developing is that when the West and the United States fail 
to take leadership at the international stage, China is ready to do so. This must be very troubling to people who do not want to see China emerge as a major player in world politics. So that's the first question that I want to raise. Is China now the new global peacemaker and the West, the warmongers? My second question is, how far is China willing to go to support Russia? China has traded extensively with Russia, avoided the sanctions, the trade uh, between China and Russia for 2022 was over $190 billion. Uh, but will China sell arms to Russia? How deep is this friendship? That is the critical question. Already, China is standing up to the West by not condemning Russia. China is not participating uh, in the West's jihad uh, against Russia, is willing to trade with China, uh, with, sorry, with Russia, has not boycotted Russia economically. So as it is, it has really stood up to the West. Now the question is, will it go the next step if the peace process fails? So I think for China also, this talk of peace process gives China a breathing room uh, to delay the more difficult decision, which is test of true friendship, as well as test of true ability of China to challenge the West. Will it weaponize Russia? Will it sell arms to Russia, which will definitely prolong the war and make it far more difficult to both Europe and US? So the second question is, how far will China go in its support for Russia? My third question is, what is China's Ukraine policy? We know China's Russia policy. It will not condemn Russia. It feels that Russia is in some way justified in pushing back at NATO. It feels that the West has double standards. It rejects the West's use of economic sanctions against Russia. But what is China's Ukraine policy? We don't know that. That is an important question for China. Can they articulate what their Ukraine policy is? We know they will not condemn the war. We know that they prefer peace. But what is their policy towards Ukraine that remains to be articulated? My fourth question is, how far will the West go if China provides weapons to Russia? If China starts selling ammunition or weapons, even drones or some other paraphernalia, military paraphernalia to, to Russia, then will the West impose sanctions on China? Can the West impose sanctions on China, given the, how intricately the two economies, Western economies and Chinese economies, are uh, intertwined? Will the West boycott Chinese goods? And of course, the rest of the world is not going to follow on that. They are so dependent on China, so there will be an increased uh, chasm between the West and the rest. So the West is going to sanction every country in the global south if China is sanctioned and they break those sanctions. So those are difficult questions that I'm sure everybody in Washington and London uh, and Berlin are hoping that China does not provide weapons for Russia and does not raise the question, how far is the West going to go to save Ukraine? Will it wage war against Russia and China? That is the question. Is the West ready to go that far? Uh, my fifth question is, what will the West do if Zelensky agrees to meet Putin and discuss ceasefire under Chinese leadership? I don't know how many of you have noticed, but Zelensky is the new god of the West. He can't go wrong. He can't say anything wrong. U.S. senators are browbeating intelligence people of their own country if they disagree with Zelensky. Was President Zelensky wrong? Senator Cruz, uh like you, I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. I personally, um, having been involved along with my boss, Secretary Blinken, in all of those negotiations with Russia to try to prevent this war in December, do not believe that had that Nord Stream 2 been cut off in January, that would have been decisive for Putin. It was important that the day the war began, the Germans cut the pipeline, as did the rest of the Europeans. But he was bound and determined to go into Ukraine, as you know. So you believe Zelensky was wrong when he said stopping Nord Stream 2 was, was 
the last and best way to stop this war. I don't think it would have stopped Putin and, you know, I And, and I, when, I the wish, government, when the government of Poland similarly said, begged the United States Senate to pass those sanctions and said, this is the last and best opportunity to stop Russia from invading Ukraine, you believe Poland was wrong too? I do not believe we would have prevented this war had the Europeans acted faster on Nord Stream 2. I wish it were the case, but I don't think it would have stopped. Okay, well, let's talk about how the war is going. And I know that you and I both agree that it is important for Russia to suffer a crushing defeat. So Zelensky, whatever he says is word. If the Germans make overtures towards Russia, even for peace, he's ready to scold the German chancellor. He's ready to scold the French president. He has even dared, Zelensky even dared to argue with America, we thought which Ukraine probably would not have existed at the moment. Russia would have taken them long ago. The billions, literally hundred billion dollars worth of aid that is coming and the weapons that the US is providing to Ukraine are perhaps the single most important uh, material uh, asset that Ukraine has at its disposal. Uh, and without the US, Ukraine will be left to deal with Russia because I'm sure the Europeans will cut and run the day the US stops helping Ukraine. So this is a very serious question. Zelensky, who has often berated Western leaders for not helping Ukraine, not giving him jet fighters, etc., has never ever criticized Xi Jinping with the same tone. Not only that, he has been very quiet. If a Western leader had gone to Moscow to discuss ceasefire, oh my God, Zelensky would have roasted them. But with Xi Jinping, he's quiet. He realizes that in the long run, Ukraine, whatever happens after the war, will depend on China for reconstruction. That is an important realization. I hope the West and Western leaders also realize that even Ukraine fears alienating China. This is an important point. Even Ukraine fears alienating China. That clearly shows how important China has lately become. A few weeks, a few months ago, everybody from in, a lot of commentators in India and here in the West, especially in the US, were talking about how China's economy is down, its COVID policy has failed, China's uh, you know, real estate market is about to collapse, and so on and so forth. And now suddenly we see that China is going around the world as if it is the superpower and it is responsible for maintaining global order. Well, that is totally fascinating. I have also an interesting question for all of you about trade with China. If you look at the list of the countries that trade, China is one of the biggest trading partners for all of the countries that seem to be acting hostile towards China, even the Quad. In 2022 alone, India had one of its highest trading years with China of close to $115 billion, second highest, with close to $100 billion trade deficit. The United States had 600 and oh, more than that, actually $750 billion worth of trade with China in 2022, one of the highest. Not only that, US exports to China were the highest ever of 177 billion dollars. The US is running a huge trade deficit with China of nearly a trillion, half a trillion dollars. But nevertheless, it is also trading in a big way with China. Look at Japan, look at Australia. The European Union, is the trade with, uh, with China is close to a trillion dollars, about 900 billion dollars or 850 around that. So all these countries, whose economies are so deeply intertwined, especially those countries who export to China and therefore their economies are dependent on Chinese markets and Chinese consumption, will they go along with the US in the so-called emerging Cold War competition, the efforts of the United States and the Quad to contain China and to isolate China? There is talk of decoupling with China without de-risking or some kind of logic in, in, in Europe where they would like to disengage with China in a way that it does not undermine their own economies. That remains to be seen. So the questions continue to arise and this has been for me a puzzle. I, I don't understand how, how, for example, India can continue to say treat China as uh, an enemy and then trade with it 
to the extent that it is its second biggest trading partner. Uh, the the trade, like I said, is over $115 billion. Let's see what happens in 2023. Uh, and if you look at the, the growth rates, China and India are going to be the two biggest economies. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, China will grow faster than India. According to the IMF, India will grow faster than China. But these are the two fastest growing economies. Uh, and uh, you must realize that if India at 3.7% trillion dollars grows at about six, six and a half percent. Its growth rate will be about $200 billion, but China at $17 trillion growing at four to five percent will add nearly $800 billion to its economy this year. So China is continuing to become economically powerful and the West already undermining the international liberal order to protect Ukraine. They're weaponizing uh, the instruments of uh, global trade uh, like the SWIFT, uh, they are triggering a, a kind of complete, uh, shall we say, destruction of existing supply chains as they, as they try to move manufacturing out of China into other parts. Uh, so basically, uh, from offshoring to friendshoring, all of these strategies, there seem to be a lot of talk, but the numbers when you look at trade do not reflect the geopolitical and strategic narrative that is coming, especially from Washington and the Quad. Each one of them has traded more with China this year than it did in the past. So if they are trying to contain China, then why are they trading and making it richer and more influential economically? All the profits that China makes, it puts into defense, it puts into increasing its own influence in the rest of the world. So what's cooking in Moscow, you might say, a new partnership between Russia and China? which raises the question, has the West failed in trying to isolate Russia? I think it has, especially India and China with more than $225 billion of trade in 2022 have ensured that Russia is not completely marginalized from the global economy. In fact, Russian oil through India is also reaching Europe and New York. So Russia is still in the market, still an important player when it comes to energy sector. So what is going to happen? I have a feeling that Xi Jinping and Putin are thinking long terms. They are trying to anticipate what other moves the West is going to make to both contain China and isolate Russia, and they're going to try and preempt it. There was a lot of talk about de-dollarization, the whole idea of doing business in currencies other than dollars so that people can avoid unilateral sanctions with the US and Western countries impose, which are not sanctioned by the UN or the Security Council. Uh, so there are, there are ways in which I think Chinese and the Russians are going to cooperate in undermining the existing neoliberal political and global order. Will they be successful? I don't know. Uh, will we see more Cold, -like, cold War-like situation in the next year? I don't expect serious action against China this year. But let's look at it again in 2024, 20, January at this time, and let's look at the economic relations between Western countries uh, and China and China's relations with other important economies which are not fully under Western hegemony, such as India, uh, Brazil, for that matter, and the global South, essentially. And if China is able to increase its trade with the global South and also with Europe, uh, then the chances are that on economic grounds, the Europeans may abandon the United States and US may become, may become isolated in its efforts to isolate Russia and China. I hope it doesn't happen. As far as I'm personally concerned, both my country and my country of origin, India, seem to be moving in a way uh, which is uh, antithetical to China. I still believe that we will have an Asian century only if India and China collaborate and cooperate, not just in the economic arena, but also in the geopolitical arena. My advice to India is to pay more attention to SCO than to G20. My advice to the United States, I think the American government should be more interested in things at home. You want to promote democracy, promote democracy at home first. You want to build infrastructure, build infrastructure at home first. You want to provide security, 
bring it home first. Thank you very much. I hope you all found this interesting, thought provoking. So please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, make sure that you share it with all your friends and don't forget to ring the bell icon. This is Mukhtar Khan for Conversations. Take care.